preparing a global workforce, teaching Chinese language and culture in California. I'm Camille Crittenden. I'm Assistant Dean for Development in International and Area Studies, which is the sponsoring division of the Berkeley China Initiative, which is a host for today's conference. We're delighted that you're all here. We have just a tremendous response to this topic, and I hope that you'll enjoy not only the proceedings from the panelists and uh, speakers from the podium, but also enjoy getting to know one another. I want to thank our sponsors. We had generous support from the Committee of 100, from the Chinese American International School, and from the Education Consul of the People's Republic of China, the General Consulate in San Francisco. We're delighted to have their support. I also want to recognize and thank a Berkeley China Initiative board member, Karen Clancy, whose idea and inspiration this conference was. She's been really tireless in helping to bring it all together, and we really appreciate her leadership in that role. <laughs> Just a few quick notes of housekeeping. You probably already recognized we have refreshments in the back. Uh, restrooms are out here in the hall, and I think there are also landline telephones, should anyone need such a thing <laughs> these days. Um, we have a distinguished guest uh, to speak, make opening remarks this morning. And to introduce him, I'd like to introduce the Dean of International and Area Studies, John Lee. Um, good morning, everyone. It's my pleasure to welcome you all and to introduce the Chancellor of University of California, Berkeley, Robert Bergeno. As many of you know, uh, UC Berkeley has been a leader in all manners of education and knowledge, and often it's ignored that we are also a leader in public outreach as well. And it's very fitting that Bob Bergeno should kick off this wonderful event. Um, as many of you know, Chancellor Bergino was for many years a very distinguished dean of science at MIT, from where he became president at the University of Toronto. Two years ago, uh, we were very fortunate to be able to attract uh, Bob Bergino to Berkeley. And although um, apparently he's overcompensated, as far as my daily observation is concerned, he earns every penny, for uh, he has the rather distinct uh, distinction of working every day when he's at Berkeley. And it's uh, one, one, one of the many virtues of Bob Bergino is that he's very committed to multiculturalism, multicultural education, and ethnic and cultural diversity, not only at Berkeley, but also California and the world at large. And so it's my pleasure to welcome Bob Bergino to give the opening remark. Thank you so much, and uh, good morning, everyone, and welcome to the Berkeley campus. Uh, first of all, I want to thank and congratulate our Dean of International and Area Studies, John Lee, for his leadership in putting together today's conference. I'm very pleased that we uh, are able to bring together educators, school administrators, board members, business leaders, and legislators to discuss the importance of teaching Chinese language and culture in California in the context of building a global workforce. Uh, in recent trips to Hong Kong and Taiwan, I've been deeply impressed by the loyalty of our Berkeley alumni. Uh, we're uniquely positioned in having a very large community of Asian alumni, both within California and in China and in Taiwan, to take advantage of this global connection. Uh, in Taiwan, I had the pleasure and privilege of having dinner with President Chen and a spouse uh, whose son is a graduate just last year of our Bolt Law School. Uh, following what John said, it's my strong view that intercultural competence, the ability to move smoothly between different cultures, is the single most important skill that we must be teaching our young people so that they can navigate and contribute to our globalized society. At Berkeley, with our large Asian student population, teaching cultural awareness of Chinese heritage benefits all of our students in better appreciating and understanding each other, our customs, and how we relate to the world. In our globalized world, our students must also have fluency in language. 
It's very important, therefore, that today you will be discussing how to build a pipeline for Chinese language instructions from kindergarten through university. Uh, indeed, here at Berkeley, we're committing resources and faculty to support Chinese language instruction by adding a class of fifth-year Chinese this year for the first time. Because of its rapidly growing economy, China presents some of the world's most vibrant opportunities as well as its most pressing challenges. Indeed, essentially by coincidence, later on today, uh, I'm meeting with members of the Chinese National Academy of Sciences and also hosting a reception for them at our home to discuss some areas in which we might have significant research collaborations, that is, between Berkeley and the Chinese Academy of Sciences. UC Berkeley is preparing students to meet opportunities and challenges posed by globalization. As a preeminent public university, we're training the new generation of leaders who need to be, new generation of leaders who need to be not just leaders in the Bay Area or California or in the United States, but need to be global leaders. Indeed, as part of this, uh, we, led by John Lee and myself, in fact, have just joined a newly formed consortium of 10 universities across four continents. That includes, in addition to Berkeley, Yale, the other US university, Oxford and Cambridge in Great Britain, University of Copenhagen and Ete Ha Zurich in uh, mainland Europe, the National University of Singapore, Beijing University, the University of Tokyo, and the Australia National University. Not a bad list of schools, actually. And I have not just a fantasy, but we envision that our students might be able to have a course of study that would allow them to spend time in various parts of the world on these campuses. For example, to study different sustainable engineering technologies or to learn about emerging, emerging economies. At Berkeley, in particular, we have a very long and distinguished history of promoting the study of East Asian languages and cultures. Our Department of East Asian Languages and Cultures was one of the first academic departments devoted to the study of Asia established in the United States dating back to 1872. Our Institute of East Asian Studies is one of the premier institutions for the study of East Asia in the United States and it promotes teaching and research on East Asia in all disciplines and professional programs. Within the Institute, the Center for Chinese Studies is among the oldest and most respected such research centers in the country. And indeed, it will celebrate its 50th anniversary next year. And we're very proud of that. If you come down to the central part of the campus and go to the north, then you will see it's a site I see every single morning, including this morning, as I walk from the chancellor's residence to my office, and I walk past the construction site of the new Changling Tian Center, which by itself shows our university's deep commitment to the study of Asia. When this building, which will be magnificent, is finished, it will provide a remarkable home for the study of Asian cultures and house the impressive collection of library materials and artifacts from Asia. The Berkeley China Initiative was launched late last year to bring together our campus strengths on China, which cover research on topics across the spectrum, from sociology and politics to art and literature, business and law. You'll be hearing much more about the Berkeley China Initiative later this afternoon from Professor Tom Gold, its director and also an associate dean of international and area studies, together with John according to John Lee. Just a few weeks ago, indeed, the Berkeley China Initiative hosted the US-China Initiative on Global Climate Change. Uh, scholars from the US and China spoke about the need for collaboration between our two countries to solve the impending crisis of global warming. And we, at that meeting, had Al Gore scheduled, but it turned out that his film is such a hit that he was in cons instead. 
receiving the glory, but he nevertheless managed to call in uh, at what we figured was three in the morning French time. Only Al Gore has this level of energy. Uh, and of course, he totally, every Chinese reporter had only one question, which is, are you running in 208? <laughs> and to which Mr. Gore gave an appropriately political, <laughs> incomprehensible response. <laughs> I'm very glad to see us continuing to have dialogue uh, on important initi initiatives through the Berkeley Chinese Initiative. Uh, in closing, let me recognize some of the special contributors to this conference. Uh, first of all, I would like especially to thank our Chinese American leaders of the Committee of 100 for their sponsorship of this conference, as well as the Chinese American International School in San Francisco and the Education Council of the Consulate General of the People's Republic of China. Uh, also like especially to recognize UC Regent, Leslie Tang Schilling, who's also a very good friend, who's co-chair of the Education Committee of the Committee of 100, and to thank her and the Committee of 100 educational consultant, Karen Leon Clancy, who we saw before, who helped organize this conference. I want to recognize and welcome Arlene Burns from the California Department of Education. There you are, Arlene. Uh, who will participate this afternoon in a panel discussion on laying the foundation for statewide standards. Uh, finally, let me recognize our two keynote speakers, Sean Randolph, President and CEO of the Bay Area Economic Forum, uh, and UC Berkeley uh, Professor Emeritus Ling Chi Wang. Ling Chi. Uh, there, way back there. Uh, I'm sure that they'll set the tone for a very stimulating morning and afternoon discussions. So again, let me conclude by thanking all of you for participating in this important initiative, and I wish you all a very successful and productive day. Thank you, Chancellor Bergenau. I know you have a very busy schedule today, and we really appreciate your time and opening remarks. I would like to invite Leslie Tang Schilling to the podium. We're delighted and very grateful at her leadership um, through the Committee of 100 and the education um, initiative of that committee to be a sponsor of the proceedings today. Leslie is a businesswoman and she has made a heroic effort actually to be back in the country today, just coming back from China, I think, yesterday. So we're delighted to have you here and thanks very much. Good morning and, and uh, welcome and thank you all for coming. Um, it's my pleasure to introduce uh, Sean Randolph, whom I just actually met this morning. Um, but I knew him by reputation um, as the president and CEO of the um, Bay Area Economic Forum. Um, I've been uh, um, working on trying to increase the teaching of Chinese language uh, and history and culture in the California system, school system, for the last four years. And uh, I guess what I've, what I've learned uh, maybe through this process uh, is, is that it takes uh, a lot of organization and a lot of um, pressure to bring about change. And uh, Mr. Randolph is going to talk a little bit about, uh, he's gonna actually, I think he's gonna give us a sneak preview of a study that he, uh, that the Bay Area Economic Forum is um, uh, sponsoring, uh, which will uh, study the effects of, of um, China trade with uh, the Bay Area and uh, without prejudicing the, uh, uh, the study, my, I, I will bet that the conclusion is that, that <laughs> um, well, no, maybe I shouldn't say that. But um, my, <laughs> but uh, what, what I what I'd like to the point I'd like to make is that um, Sean represents a very important segment of of our community. Um, it's the Bay Area Economic Forum is a uh, combination of uh, all stakeholders in the California economy: labor, business, education, um, and it's going to take organizations like the Bay Area Economic Forum to help us bring about this change that I think we're all in this room because we're interested in, in seeing change. 
So my advice to you is, is listen to Sean, listen to what he has to say, and then hound him afterwards. So Sean, without. <laughs> Well, thanks very much, Leslie, and thanks for the chance to be here. I, I, I really love being on campus, and when the invitation came to speak this morning, I had no hesitation in saying yes, because this is just a terrific topic. And as Leslie told you, we've been actually working at the Bay Area Economic Forum for almost a year now on a report on the depth and breadth and nature of the economic as well as non-economic ties that linked uh, California and especially the Bay Area with greater China, with the PRC, Taiwan and Hong Kong. Uh, because we, we know already that it's an immensely important story and becoming more and more important. And it really has been more fascinating than I expected. It's sort of like an onion. We start looking at the shape, we peel a layer off and another layer. You think you've got the story and you find another layer underneath and another layer underneath and another layer underneath and there's this huge uh, infrastructure of relationships that link us with China that is getting bigger by the day. And so, as Leslie said, this particular report, well, I don't think it'll be out until maybe September, but I, I'll give you in 20 minutes as much as I can of a capsule preview of, of what we're coming up with. Uh, and then stay tuned for the, the whole text. Um, let me start with the story. And it really goes back to uh, the gold rush. So. As it turns out, I think a lot of us have accounts at Wells Fargo Bank. And uh, back in the 1800s, it turns out that Chinese miners played a very critical role in uh, the development of Wells Fargo into what it is today. And at that time, the leading express agent that handled gold in San Francisco coming in from the foothills was a company called Adams and Company. And they were doing very well, and they wanted to build an office in downtown San Francisco. And they ordered the granite to be cut and shipped from China. And so when it arrived, they wanted to put the building on this particular corner, and the Chinese workmen refused to work on it. They couldn't figure this out, so they brought a, a Chinese architect from China, and he said, well, the problem is this stone was quarried in China and cut and marked in certain ways where according to the principles of feng shui, it can't be on this corner, it has to be on that corner. And Therefore, the Chinese workers wouldn't put it together. Well, the company thought, well, that's nonsense. They went ahead and they somehow got the bank built on the corner it was located on. Uh, not long after that, there was a run on banks in, in San Francisco, uh, 55, uh, this was 1855, and over 200 banks closed. Now, what had happened in the meantime was no Chinese would go into the Adams Bank. It was unlucky. They took all their business to this little upstart company called Wells Fargo, two blocks down the street. It turns out that during the banking crisis, every bank in San Francisco failed except for Wells Fargo because of the Chinese customers. They remained loyal because they shifted their business into Wells Fargo. And it was all because of cut granite and feng shui. So hopefully everybody who is of Chinese ancestry could get a, like a free account or something. I don't know. But it, it does suggest that there's a lot of history here in the Bay Area uh, with China. In fact, there's more history than any place else in the United States. And we're finding a, an incredible depth and breadth of relationships that are growing by the day. So uh, just for a couple moments of history, uh, Chinese started to come here in uh, 1848, the first Chinese. By 1852, there were about 18,000 Chinese here. The Pacific Mail Line, which, which is the main shipping line that brought most of the Chinese here to California, their dock in San Francisco ended up being the central processing point for Chinese entering the United States at that time. A lot of these people came over in wor as workers and gold miners. Uh, they, they built uh, a great deal of the, the railway, the Transcontinental Railway, uh, from Sacramento to Promontory Point, Utah, and other railroads in the U.S., especially the West. And from the 1850s on, the Chinese community was a very significant part of the economy here in the Bay Area. Uh, Chinese fishermen dominated the shrimping industry. There were 20 different shrimping camps around the Bay that were Chinese, including here at Hunter's Point and around what's now China Camp in, in Marin County. And that was really the case for decades and decades and decades. 
Uh, by 1870, about a quarter of all the Chinese immigrants in the U.S. were in the Bay Area. By 1900, almost half of all the Chinese immigrants in the U.S. were right here in the San Francisco area. Uh, the Chinese Exclusion Act uh, later in the 1800s really slowed down the immigration a lot, but it turns out there was an exception, especially for merchants. And so although formal immigration really slowed down tremendously, Chinese tradespeople and merchants came in very, very large numbers. Uh, then you had the, the great earthquake of 1906, and a lot of the records were destroyed. And there was another wave of immigration of so-called paper sons, Chinese who claimed to be the children of Chinese already here. Now, there was a lot of document fabrication. This was kind of a very early image, uh, version of illegal immigration today. Lots of paper documents, paper sons coming over. And in the subsequent 30 years, about 175,000 Chinese emigrated here to California through Angel Island. Uh, just a tremendous, tremendous number. So that was the first wave of immigration, the gold rush. Second wave of immigration uh, coming through Angel Island. Uh, and today we still have the legacy of those early immigration waves here in the, the Bay Area in California. But, and that has left us with commercial and social and cultural and charitable organizations that figure prominently in the economy and they go back well over a hundred years now. Now, one of the interesting things uh, about the Chinese story here uh, is that it really started to shift from that legacy cultural base, which was still very vibrant, but in the 1970s, especially 1980s, we saw a different wave of immigration coming over, starting from Hong Kong, then Taiwan, and then the PRC. Uh, in 1965, or starting about then, particularly bad time in China with the Cultural Revolution, there was a big wave of immigration coming in from Hong Kong. Uh, subsequently, uh, you had uh, large numbers of students in the 70s and 80s coming with encouragement from the government of Taiwan into the Bay Area to study especially uh, engineering. Uh, the government was really looking to jumpstart its high-tech community. This was when Sun Chu uh, Technology Park was being developed in Taiwan. Lots of MBA students came from uh, Hong Kong at about the same time. And then you had another wave of immigration coming in from mainland China uh, especially in the early 1990s, primarily studying science, engineering, business, uh, and to some uh, extent law. And these, uh, collectively, these waves of immigration have built layers and layers within our community that have networks of social organizations, cultural organizations, and economic organizations that provide a unique foundation for the business and economic ties that we have here today. So uh, I'll just tick off a few of the major categories just to kind of show how complex but how very large this picture is now. So academic ties first. Great thing we're here at Berkeley. It's probably the, the premier university in the U.S. for doing studies uh, on China and especially for receiving Chinese students. Before 1979, there were no students from mainland China here uh, in the United States. By 1988, it was the leading country sending students here to the U.S. Uh, the number of Chinese students in the country grew then from about 39,000 in 1994 to uh, 62,000 in 2004. So lots and lots of Chinese students. Uh, as far as you know, there are about 5,500 Chinese graduate and undergraduate students uh, from China, Taiwan, and Hong Kong here in the Bay Area. This was for the academic year 2004-2005. Major schools were th about 1,300 at UC Davis, uh, about 1,200 at San Francisco State, uh, San Jose State, about 1,000 Stanford, 700 plus in Berkeley, something over 600, and University of San Francisco, about 125 or so. Uh, You've already heard from Chancellor Bergeno about the terrific institutions here at Berkeley, a really nationally prominent organizations focusing on China studies. Um, Changlin Tan, the uh, former chancellor here, was actually the chairman for many years of the Bayer Economic Forum, so uh, we really highly respect his leadership and that of Berkeley in this important area. Chinese donors have given about $53 million uh, to Berkeley for various programs, including the Tian Center. And uh, Li Ka Sheng's foundation has helped build the Li Ka Sheng uh, Center for Biomedical and Health Sciences here at Berkeley. 
Uh, Stanford, 700 plus students, uh, mostly in engineering, business, and science, um, accounted for almost 10% of its student body. There's more than 70 faculty members at Stanford are from greater China. Uh, foreign born uh, Chinese donors are given about 50 million there. And so there's a tremendous wave of philanthropy and donations coming from China because of the institutional ties between China uh, and our educational institutions here in the Bay Area. Davis attracts large numbers of Chinese students for veterinary medicine, environmental sciences, and agriculture. And there is a Jesuit connection be with China through University of San Francisco uh, because there's such a deep history of the Jesuit community in, in China. Uh, so lots and lots of academic ties. And as the universities attract students, lots of them stay here. And many of them go back to China. But these become permanent relationships between China and the Bay Area. Then let's look at associations, uh, especially related to business. A lot of these associations began as cultural groups. A lot began with sort of quasi-governmental encouragement uh, from their home countries, whether it's the PRC or Taiwan or Hong Kong, and they've become very important over the years. Uh, of course, on the formal government side, we have the Hong Kong Economic and Trade Office. We have the Hong Kong Association of Northern California. In Taiwan, we've got the Taipei Economic and Cultural Office, the Taiwan Trade Center. Uh, there's, of course, the Chinese consulate, all of these handling uh, official relations uh, with the US representing those countries here. I think the first major non-governmental organization in the area was the Asian Business League of San Francisco. Uh, they have since uh, expanded uh, following a trend uh, we see in all these organizations to open a chapter in Silicon Valley. And there really has been a quiet revolution in these networking organizations as focus has shifted from predominantly a San Francisco focus to a Silicon Valley focus. And that really reflects the huge wave of students coming in to the region to focus on the technology economy, to participate in it, and to bring some of that back to Taiwan and China in particular. This has been going on for about 20 years now. So uh, just a few of the organizations, I, I could go on. There's a long list that will be in the report. But uh, a couple of the organizations I could mention, the Chinese Institute of Engineers, the Asian American Manufacturers Association, which is now the Asian American Multi-Technology Association. Those go back to 1979 and 1980. Uh, from about 40 members in 79, the Bay Area chapter of the Chinese Institute of Engineers now has about 900. Uh, the Asian American Multi-Technology Association grew from about 21 members to more than 1,100 and 800 companies today. So this is really a huge, huge network. Uh, the engineers coming in, especially from China into Silicon Valley, uh, formed many, many organizations. And I won't list them all by name, but specifically Chinese and Chinese American associations in electro-optics software professionals, computers, engineering, semiconductor professionals, engineering, information storage, wireless technology, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Many, many uh, organizations with large, large membership bases focused on particular technology sectors and on networking here, helping their members establish businesses, helping them uh, develop businesses here in the Bay Area, and more and more now, helping them develop businesses back with China. So we're seeing these organizations start to interact together more. Ones that were mostly Chinese mainland often now have people from Taiwan and Hong Kong and vice versa. And more and more, as the economy in China has grown, together, of course, with Hong Kong and Taiwan, we're seeing large numbers of Chinese going back, uh, especially to mainland China, to take advantage as entrepreneurs of the opportunities that are growing up there. And of course, the Chinese government has explicitly been encouraging them to come back with lots of incentives that contribute to the growth of the economy there. And one could ask, well, do we lose by that? Uh, I don't think so, because the fact that they are there now means very often they don't leave here. There is a bridge now, a bridge of human capital that links the Bay Area and California with China with these large numbers of Chinese who very often studied here, uh, who have deep roots here, who now have family here permanently, who are now what they call astronauts. They're flying back and forth to China. You, you're more likely to meet them in an airport lounge than you are at either end, uh, and who are actually 
building uh, even deeper two-way trade and investment relationships between California uh, and, and China. Uh, there are other organizations I, I could mention that do this. Uh, they're very, very important to this process. Uh, the Monty Jade Science and Technology Association, especially uh, focused on uh, connections with Taiwan. Uh, their Silicon Valley chapter has 2,000 individuals, more than 200 corporate members. Um, I can't read very well here. Ah. And anyway. I could give you a page of names, but this is a tremendous infrastructure that our economic ties with China are being built on even as we speak. Um, I'm skipping over pages of organizations here. Uh, so just the bottom line of some of this, Chinese-run technology startups uh, here just in Silicon Valley accounted for about $16 billion in annual sales uh, in the late 1990s. That was at the height of the tech bubble. It went down, but it's probably back up again. We know that. Tech startups managed by Chinese nationals account for about 20% of Silicon Valley firms today. So we find Chinese who came from the mainland, as well as Taiwan and Hong Kong, who very often studied here at Bay Area universities like Berkeley, who are now in very prominent leadership positions as CEOs, chief technology officers, CIOs, and in major research positions uh, throughout Silicon Valley and throughout the Bay Area economy. Another category of networking, non-governmental public policy organizations. Again, there's a long list. Committee of 100 is very prominent in that. The 1990 Institute is very prominent. Here in the Bay Area, the Asia Foundation has been very, very active in working with Chinese organizations on legal reform, institutional reform in China. The Asian Art Museum, one of the largest collections of Chinese art in the world, is here, a major cultural anchor for China exchanges here in the Bay Area. This is another important dimension of our relationship. Yet another dimension, sister city relationships. There are nine Bay Area cities that have sister city ties with China. Uh, and forgive me if I fracture the Chinese, but Berkeley uh, has a relationship with the Haidian District in Beijing, Davis with Wuxi, Los Altos with uh, the Shenlin District of Taiwan, Milpitas with Weizhou, China, Oakland with Dalian, China, Redwood City with Zhuhai, Richmond with Zhou Shan, San Francisco with Shanghai and Taipei, and San Jose with Tainan. And of course, I think the San Francisco-Shanghai relationship is especially important because really those were days when it was very, very early when it was set up in our relationship in the U.S. with China. San Francisco was the city that broke the ice with China in establishing the first major sister city relationship. There have been more than 150 exchanges since then, and uh, it really was a, a pioneering relationship in U.S.-China relations. So as we go on looking at concrete trade and investment. So this is a lot of very important infrastructures. How, how is that being reflected? Well, just if we look first at manufactured trade, things we send back and forth to China. So a lot of it comes by ship. For us here in Northern California, most comes through the Port of Oakland. Uh, the measurement is FEU. These are 40-foot containers. Uh, so imports uh, in these containers from Hong Kong to PRC and Taiwan through Northern California Customs District grew from about 85,000 FEUs in 2001 to 219,000 FEUs in 2005. That is a lot of growth. Uh, it's really very, very remarkable. Uh, the cargo from the PRC, this is just from the China mainland to the Bay Area, grew an average of 36% per year since 2002 with the most dramatic growth being in 2004, it grew 44%, and 2005, 40%. That is enormous growth. So it's China trade that is driving the growth of imports uh, through Bay Area ports, even more so through Southern California ports like LA and Long Beach. And this is reflecting both the growth in China's economy, the fact that a lot of manufacturing that was once done in, in Hong Kong and Taiwan has been moving to the mainland, so that's fueling a lot of the trade coming across from China. Um, and it's really fuel, uh, reflecting also the fact that we have enormous development in these gateways of Shanghai uh, 
uh, Guangzhou, uh, not to mention, of course, Hong Kong. Uh, a lot of it goes by air, uh, and I think it's worth mentioning right here in Oakland, Federal Express. Uh, they've expanded their China service from 23 to 26 weekly flights now. Uh, their major West Coast hub is here uh, at Oakland International Airport. Uh, in 2008, they're going to shift their Asian hub from Subic Bay in the Philippines uh, into China. A uh, new $150 million facility is going to be in Guangzhou, and they are looking at about 10% annual air cargo growth uh, from here to China and from China to here between now and 2025. Huge, huge volume of international trade. And we find similar growth in air shipments, a lot of high value stuff, semiconductors, computers, through uh, SFO as air cargo. And then, uh, so the total value of, of trade moving through the Bay Area Customs District, this was last year, was uh, almost $27 billion. That's a lot of trade by any standard, just moving back and forth between this area and, and China. So that's manufactured goods. So what about services? I think the services are really a big part of the untold story where China is concerned. We measure, you know, our trade statistics measure boxes that move. They don't measure. It's hard to track people providing services uh, of all kinds, but it's a huge piece of the story. And in fact, Bay Area firms have been leaders in opening China and pioneering business in China uh, in the service area. Uh, financial services, major banks, United Commercial Bank here uh, in San Francisco, Wells Fargo HSB Trade Bank is a joint venture of Wells Fargo and HSBC in Hong Kong focuses especially on financing trade, especially between California and China. There are other Chinese banks that have their branches here in the Bay Area, especially San Francisco. Legal services is another category. There's a list of law firms here about a mile long that have now opened offices in China. And American lawyers, especially pioneered by Bay Area law firms, are extremely active, probably the most active group in the country in China, working with Chinese companies, working with foreign multinationals, especially on investment issues in China. And Bay Area lawyers and judges and universities, such here as here at Berkeley through Bolt Hall, have been really pioneers in working with, uh, with China and Chinese institutions on legal reform and rule of law reforms. Uh, Another big category that I think is really important today is Internet services. Of course, the Bay Area's uh, home base for the Internet industry, and China has really embraced the Internet more than any other country in the world, really. Right now, they have about 111 million Internet users. Half of them have broadband services. I don't have broadband at my house, but half of those people in China, more than 50 million, have it. And really, when we look at it carefully, the Internet industry in, in China is being shaped heavily by uh, Bay Area companies. Uh, they're literally helping to build China's internet from the ground up. Uh, Google has a major presence there. Uh, they invested in Baidu.com, major share, uh, which is the largest internet uh, service in China. They subsequently sold that, but Baidu was founded actually by two Bay Area Chinese American uh, leaders uh, who had actually been part of the Multi-Technology Association. Um, Baidu also benefited from major investment from a Bay Area VC, uh, Draper Fisher Jurvetson, and from IDG Venture Capital. So it was, uh, it was investment from Bay Area firms that got Baidu going. Other major VCs with, firm, with uh, China funds include IDG again, Walden International. Yahoo is very, very deep into China. They have an arrangement across investment with Alibaba.com, which is based in Hangzhou. And uh, they really have turned over to Alibaba their China market development. So very, very competitive uh, market for our Bay Area companies there, uh, eBay and others as well. And the last two categories I would mention, architecture, engineering, construction, uh, there right now are about 4.7 billion square feet of, of, of construction uh, going on in China. That's up from $2 billion in 1998. Shanghai alone has over 4,000 skyscrapers with another 1,000 on the books. You could drop San Francisco into that and you couldn't find it. And Bay Area firms have really been playing a very prominent role in, in the construction, really more the design and engineering and urban planning 
in China. Uh, Genscher Architecture and Design and Planning in San Francisco. The Shanghai office has designed more than 60 projects in China. Skidmore Owings and Merrill here in San Francisco gets nearly a third of their revenues from China. Just two examples from a long list I could mention of their projects. They did the master plan for the Wangpu Riverfront in Shanghai, where they really embedded the principle of public access to the waterfront in urban planning in China. And the Shintaiti District, which is an old uh, historic district in Shanghai, the Chinese have been tearing these things down like mad. SOM said, no, you can, you can make this pay. They rebuilt it, and now it is a vibrant uh, entertainment and commercial district, which really has been the leading demonstration project in China to say you don't have to tear down your historic structures. You can actually make them pay and be exciting places. Uh, many other firms I could talk about. Uh, engineering, Bechtel does massive multi-billion dollar projects in China. Um, in our technology companies, Hewlett Packard, a long history there. It has more than 5,000 employees today in China, uh, multiple joint ventures, uh, R&D centers. I won't go into all their locations. Very, very, very deep. Uh, Cisco, again, R&D centers in China. Uh, large numbers of employees. Oracle. You could go through all of our major technology companies in the Bay Area and Silicon Valley, and just about all of them uh, have uh, multiple offices, uh, thousands of employees and R&D uh, facilities in China. And lastly, I would mention, again, the role that investment from Bay Area companies is playing there, especially in entrepreneurial activity and in technology companies. Uh, our VC, company, VC companies here, Berlin Company in, uh, in the area of, of biotech, uh, Axel Partners, IDG Venture Capital, Intel Capital, Dole Capital Management, Draper Fisher Jervis, you go down the line, Almost every major VC firm in the Bay Area has now established a, a China fund. And that really is a major support for entrepreneurship uh, uh, and technology development in China, much of it in ways that will come back and benefit us here. So the bottom line, uh, I could talk for an hour, but I say I've got two minutes. So that just might give you a flavor of this, this relatively invisible infrastructure of social and cultural and networking organizations that, that spreads throughout the Bay Area, that is a platform for our business to grow. And the activity of our investing companies and our technology companies and our design and urban planning companies and our legal community and our academic community in China, I think when you look back and, and look at it in perspective, there is no place in the United States that has anything comparable to the depth and the breadth of the market intelligence we have here and the bridges and the connections social, cultural, and economic to China. So it's a huge opportunity. Uh, if we don't seize on it, if we don't invest in things like language development, uh, we won't be able to capitalize it on it fully. But if we do make the right kind of, of investments, uh, the Bay Area and California are going to be uh, uh, first rung partners uh, and full participants in China's development, which is a very exciting prospect. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Randolph. That was a really terrific historical overview and really gave a broad cultural and economic business context for our purposes here today. I'd like to invite Dr. Gay Yuan and the first panel to come to the stage, please. We're going to launch right into teaching Chinese. Where are we and where do we want to go? Many of you already have programs in your schools or are thinking about implementing them or are thinking about how to bring Chinese language instruction to your children. Um, I am anticipating that we'll have some suggestions and answers from the folks here on the stage. We're very honored to have this uh, set of panelists here today. They'll each say a few things about themselves. It's moderated by Dr. Gay Yuan, who teaches at California State University in Los Angeles. She teaches language and literacy in the Division of Curriculum and Instruction in the Charter College of Education. And she will 
help to introduce the other panelists and they'll be giving you a little bit of an overview of their various activities and programs. I hope we'll have a few minutes at the end of their conversation for questions from the audience. So if you have questions at that time, we have a microphone here at the side of the room. We would appreciate it if you would use the mic so that all of us can hear the question. Um, this. The proceedings are also being recorded for later webcasts, so that would help us to have the questions spoken clearly into the microphone as well. So we're just getting the name tags set up on here so you all can identify who the various panelists are. But I will turn it over to Dr. Ewan. Thank you very much. Um, before we start this panel, just for our sake, so that we know who we are speaking to and with, um, can you, can I just take a quick hand raise survey of the audience? How many of you in the audience are actually teachers, classroom teachers in the K, let, let's break it this down, in the K-12 level? How many are at the university level teachers, instructors? How many are administrators? How many are playing the parent role in this conference? Okay, policy makers. Very good. Did I miss any major segment? Funders, <laughs> money people, that's what I want. Okay, thank you very much. How many of you in the audience speak one or more dialect of Chinese? Very nice, thank you. As mentioned, my name is Gay Yuan, and I'm, from, uh, I'm a professor of teacher education at California State uh, University in Los Angeles. So I think I'm the only Southerner here today. Um, I have the privilege of moderating this panel. The title of it is, uh, Where Are We and Where Do We Want to Go? Uh, we have the privilege and pleasure of having three distinguished panel members with us. And I will introduce them very briefly, but my introduction won't do the, them justice, so that as they speak um, and do their presentation, I'm sure that you will get a, even a better idea of um, their importance and, and the important work that they have done and continue to do in the area of Chinese language and cultural instruction. My, my friend to my right is Alex, uh, Alice Carnes. I've had the pleasure of meeting Alice through several um, of the small and large group meetings where we find that we both are very much devoted to the uh, teaching of, of Chinese uh, language and culture. She, I, I call her the mother of um, international language um, education. She has served on the board of the uh, Chinese American International School for years, one of the founding members of international studies for the CSU system, and she continues to do her very important work in this area. A new friend I met today is um, Dr. Beverly Hahn Fincher, and I call her the international scholar and educator. She's multilingual, multicultural, uh, born in Vietnam, studied all over, and uh, is currently associated with a multitude of universities, including the Australian National University, the University of Maryland, Beijing University, and she just, I don't know when this lady sleeps because she just seems to be everywhere and doing everything. C.K. Shun is another new friend that I met today, and he is uh, going to tell us more about what Better Chinese is, the organization that he's associated with. And uh, from what I understand, there's been many products and many bridging activities from the mid-70s on that relates to our topic of interest today. So um, I think we'll, we'll do a, a structure that will be 10 minutes of presentation from each of our um, speakers, and I'll open then up to questions and answers from the audience, if that's okay. I am not going to speak. My area is, like I said, teacher education in California, but there will be a panel. The, I think the 315 panel will give you a better idea of what's going on in California in terms of policy, and so I'll, I'll just moderate. <laughs> 
So Alice, would you like to go first? We'll take the elementary school first and move, move along. The Chinese American International School has just completed 25 years of uh, operation, growing from literally four students in rented space to 400 full-time students attending their own campus in the, Ch in the San Francisco Civic Center uh, every day. The students who are graduating from CASE, having spent 10 years eight to 10 years, including their um, pre preschool and kindergarten time, are completing their language studies with a level of comfort, fluency, and naturalness uh, that is difficult to duplicate in any of other model than that of elementary immersion. I know that there are a number of people here today who are considering the adoption of programs or who are working through issues of articulation. And I don't want to give you an exhaustive description of the program structure at CASE, but I want to tell you a little bit about uh, what, why we think things work as well they do, as they do, why we can't prove it, what needs to be happening in terms of future opportunities for students who have this kind of excellent preparation, and what California can do uh, to a, through, through better cooperation among the, all of the moving parts that are represented here today to uh, achieve, achieve the leadership in the whole field of Chinese language studies, which it should have given the rich resources that we heard about from Mr. Randolph earlier. CASE is an independent school um, established, uh, uh, interestingly enough, by a group of uh, very public, publicly involved uh, uh, citizens uh, 25 years ago. Um, it's an independent school in part because San Francisco had already made a very substantial commitment to um, uh, bilingual education through the establishment of its Japanese and Cantonese programs. And among the founders of CASE, uh, a, member, a then member of the Board of Supervisors and a sitting appellate judge and, and others who were active in civic life, uh, understood that the likelihood of getting a third program sponsored through the public system at that time was not going to happen and yet Mandarin language was not represented in the early opportunities for students to study. What we know about immersion since they took their first steps uh, and moved using a fundamentally the French bilingual model, uh, which has been incorporated by the um, French government in its expat schools all over the world, uh, is that you can't model a Chinese immersion program after the Romance languages and expect to get the same results. And the number of the programs that have been undertaken in California uh, have understandably, for, e for, for some kind of uniformity, have been uh, modeled after uh, primarily the Spanish language programs. The Standard assumption is that students will begin uh, their studies uh, at the kindergarten or first grade level in somewhere between 70 to 90 percent of their, spending somewhere between 70 to 90 percent of their time in the target language. And one of the things that distinguishes um, CASE, as, as we refer to our very long school name, uh, is that we made some adjustments in that m model very early on, in part due to the work of a distinguished Berkeley faculty member, Dr. Lily Wong Fillmore, uh, whose work in applied linguistics and bilingual education has moved many mountains all over this, uh, all over the country. Her point was that if you don't maintain uh, intellectual development ordinary um, 
educational progress in the native language, uh, you don't end up with a student who with with a student who is balanced in their uh, in their development, and that the assumption that you must spend 70 to 90 percent of time in the target language uh, and the language of acquisition may impair the orderly development of the student, orderly progress of the student through the the, all of the important cognitive functions of the early elementary years. And that has been a very helpful change for Case and for others who have taken the model because one of the big scary things that parents and administrators have to deal with is the question, how can my student, how can my child possibly keep up in basic English studies if they're immersed in another language, particularly something as different as Chinese, 70 to 90 percent of the time? The answer is, well, it can be done. There are districts who do it that way. Their proof of the balance is in fact that the students do equally well on standardized tests of achievement. But we, what we are lacking, when I said before, we know immersion works. We have uh, 400 students who do it every day and who move steadily through uh, very demanding high school programs. And I'm happy to say, increasingly, uh, since I've looked at a whole generation of students now, uh, we follow them through their university studies as well. So we know that they can manage, and they manage well, and that they succeed, but we can't prove it. And we can't prove it because we have so little science to back up um, our, our, our practice. There are bright lights and shining examples of elementary immersion education all around the country. Case has had the pri privilege of helping uh, grow or start a number of those. The Cooper, one in the Cupertino School District, another in the Bay Area, at the um, uh, Peninsula International School. We were able to give major support in materials and curriculum to the Potomac Elementary School uh, several years ago, and. By being, by being here and growing the program and developing the models and the materials and by training our own teachers in-house, by knowing that there was no place to go for somebody to tell us how to do this, we basically put the primer together and share it with great pleasure. But it's been a matter of great concern to us uh, as we look back on the work of 25 years and forward to the work that remains to be done, that there has been such a, a dearth of engagement with the university communities who should be caring much more deeply than our experience indicates they have in the past about how this works. Second language acquisition is studied uh, at a level of very high uh, accomplishment in Canada. And recently, with a, with a colleague from the board of CASE, uh, I attended uh, a major conference in Toronto in which the leading uh, theoreticians uh, and, uh, and, publish and scholars in the field came together in an international conference on language acquisition and, and bilingual education. Um, all of the big names were there. And they said some very inspiring things. The field itself is moving with leaps and bounds, pulling together for the first time in the 25 years that I've been looking at it, insights from cognitive science, early child development, um, the, the traditional language and linguistic studies, but in that very august body of, uh, of people, not a single major presentation was made on Chinese. And among 150 posters from graduate students who had come from all over the world um, to share the insights of this important group, not a single, not a single presentation was made on Chinese at the pre-collegiate level. So I sit here as, a, as a, uh, an unabashed cheerleader and a proud uh, participant 
in a school which has succeeded, in a model which we know works, but which needs to be connected uh, to the university community and to the uh, people who have, who should care a good deal more about the population which is rising to come to the university, prepared in ways that their typical undergraduate <laughs> students uh, have not been before. Uh, the graduates that Case sends out to high schools don't fit in the standard four-year high school program. They arrive with a level of uh, refinement in tones, uh, comfort in the exercise in general, and uh, th especially those who have spent uh, in our year or two year, uh, either in the seventh grade and, and increasingly in, in earlier years, uh, time in China in the exchange programs, a complete comfort, a co complete acculturation to the, uh, the nuances of communication. Uh, not just accomplished vocabulary, lists of words, but communication at a meaningful level. And increasingly, the students who have had the immersion experience are going to be challenging and are challenging uh, the high school programs and the university programs that they make, to make move through uh, in ways that have not yet, been, not yet been met. The students who've been in an immersion program um, are put there by parent choice. And that's not likely to change. Not very many five and six year olds uh, put those options out to their parents for, for, uh, for consideration. But the students who continue uh, from that experience to high school and a university will be uh, moving into many other fields in their uh, as they cho make their own ch choices of things to study, uh, from engineering to um, uh, art, architecture, finance, culture at all levels. But they will be an elite core of competent people in whatever fields they choose to move in uh, as the rich business community of San Francisco and the rest of the country moves forward uh, to find people, Americans of all backgrounds, who can represent the economic cultural interests of this country in, in dealing with greater China. There are a couple of things that uh, I would encourage the group here of practitioners to pay particular attention to uh, because they seem to me that to represent the greatest uh, challenges to moving, uh, seri moving seriously ahead in expanding the opportunities for California students and other American students to study Chinese. We need to deal urgently with the issues of articulation and teacher training, and it's a matter of great satisfaction to me that after sitting down with uh, members, representatives of the Berkeley campus a year ago through the sponsorship of uh, Leslie Schilling and the Committee of 100, uh, this conference has a, is a follow through, is a result of addressing those issues that need further attention. California has, a, um, has everything in place to lead the nation in models and practice of Chinese language study at all level. But the fragmentation uh, that describes our reality won't get us moving ahead much farther. We need to nourish and support the teaching profession at all levels to come together on regular basis because if anything, if I've learned anything in 25 years, it's that it's, this is a teacher-driven activity, and yet um, there is no effective organization uh, statewide of language teachers which, which can come together in, a, in an entrepreneurial fashion to move an agenda. 
The university-based uh, Chinese language teachers have been generous in their attention to sponsorship of the language contents, language um, contests on a biannual basis. But other than the work that's been going on uh, at Berkeley in the last year or two, uh, we cannot say, we cannot look any place in this state to meaningful collaboration uh, between the university and the pre-collegiate level in program design, assessment, training, evaluation. We've got a lot of work to do. We have all of the elements for success. And I think that the conversation that will continue today uh, will make a big difference. We're happy to share all the detail you want about CASE. Uh, we've left some uh, materials on the table outside for those of you who want to study the program design in more detail. And we welcome a staggering number of visitors from all over the country who want to come and see that it really does work. Thanks so much. Thank you, Alice. Uh, we're going to move now to Mr. C.K. Shen because the work that he does also touches upon the K-12 uh, aspects of language studies. And so, Mr. Shen. I, I thought uh, here at Berkeley uh, we would go ladies first, but um, I came to the States in the 60s. And when I was at Penn State, I actually 1967, 68, 69, was a teaching assistant because at that time Penn State only had one Chinese professor teaching Chinese, and um, there were other Chinese around. But I guess my pronunciation accent was closer what to what uh, the professor thought was good enough. So. Um, that's how I got my beginning with uh, the teaching of Chinese. Then I uh, went on to join the United Nations for 23 years, um, doing various work, translation, um, communication between the country, uh, about 90 percent with China. Um, I also came to uh, observe that um, there's always interest, always people wanting to learn Chinese, non-Chinese. Uh, yet, the results tend to be disappointing. And um, at that time, uh, the materials supply was very limited. In the States, some universities had curriculum. Um, from Taiwan and China, there were limited materials. Um, somehow, myself and my wife, uh, we have our own children, we didn't believe and uh, we certainly wouldn't accept that learning Chinese or teaching Chinese should be an unsuccessful experience for the uh, majority of learners. It should be the other way around. Um, it's not a difficult language, for as I must, uh, although uh, I guess all of us here are ac experts already, but uh, out there uh, in the American public, still the uh, image of Chinese language is that it's difficult. Um, so much so that people today still say when they, you know, somebody says something that's, that's incomprehensible, they, the um, American would say, are you, are you talking Chinese? So anyhow, this, this is how I got started. And um, so uh, today at Berkeley, um, I'm very thankful and honored to have this opportunity to present uh, what you may call Better Chinese Initiative. And uh, we are a small private um, organization. We started in 1997 uh, when we were in Hong Kong uh, at that time. Um, there were hundreds, uh, in fact, thousands of children, K to 12, um, attending international schools. Uh, most of them uh, would take Chinese as their foreign language or second language study. 
uh, the experience there, by and large, still was not satisfactory. And uh, we as parents and also uh, um, as concerned uh, members of the community, we started to work with other parents and we developed a book club to provide reading materials in Chinese for children, K to 12. That wasn't there then even in the mid to late 90s. And then um, that turned out to be useful. So we were encouraged again to provide classes uh, in, it, in supplement to school was, what schools were providing. So we built a, a better Chinese education center. And from there on, we moved into publishing. Uh, so in, 19, in two, year 2000, we came out with our first uh, set of materials called My First Chinese Words. Um, I think it's, we have learned from other, from previous um, materials that were uh, in use and from other teachers that we work with. Um, we took a different approach, we believe. We uh, very much emphasize the children's perspective. And also in this case, there's a cultural um, background involved. So there's also the importance of um, looking at the whole exercise, the whole experience from a non-Chinese, um, a Western, rather from a Western perspective. Um, because most of the materials that were available then, or even today, were produced and designed um, in Taiwan or in China by highly uh, accomplished experts, but most of them do not have the experience of um, working in a non-Chinese environment with non-Chinese trying to learn Chinese. So we try to uh, take a children's and Western perspective. Uh, so far it has uh, met with uh, some success. Uh, most recently, the San Francisco Unified School District uh, in implementing its decision to start Mandarin immersion uh, this coming fall. Uh, a committee, a curriculum committee was set up and um, after ext review of ex uh, materials available, um, they adopted unanimously the, our first set, my first Chinese words. Um, in short, I don't want to go into too much of the kind of program products or we offer because this is not a commercial event here. Um, but I just would like to share with you that um, it's so important that we work with children, uh, nurture and build on their natural learning instincts and abilities. Um, this may not be very traditional Chinese to uh, try to um, work, at least in the old days, because education was for a long time, just like the rest of the world, uh, a luxury. But today, education here, especially in America, um, has grown a lot. So early childhood education in the past 50, 60 years has progressed a lot. So as uh, advocates or Chinese educators, teachers, parents, we need to know all of that and we need to take advantage of all of that. Otherwise, um, the same painful experience will happen again for our children. Uh, many, many of you here today know that more than half, I would say, uh, of the Chinese American group um, attended weekend Chinese schools, starting at age three or four or five. And by the time they're age 10 or 11, they would say, I hate Chinese. Now that's where Chinese teaching used to be, here in California and elsewhere. And I think fortunately we have progressed uh, and 
many, many people are taking initiatives to um, go beyond that. Like uh, Case Chinese American International School and other institutions. Uh, also, I do know that um, weekend Chinese school Chinese teachers have uh, been trying to um, train themselves or find training for themselves so that they can offer the kind of uh, learning experience young American children today um, require. Um, I think that's about the gist of what I would like to share with you today. Is that okay? Thank you, CK. <laughs> and, and as one of the uh, dropouts, after school Chinese school dropouts at age uh, 12, you, you're, you are right. But even with the, um, with the weekend and the after school Chinese schools, the progress that you've mentioned is being noted. And I think what's good is everyone's using the research and the data and the knowledge that we've developed through the last decades on second language learning and heritage language teaching where, um, where all teachers are benefiting from that type of professional development. Next, I'd like to um, turn the, the speak the mic over to Dr. Beverly Hong Fincher. She also has some um, language teaching products that she's developed that she will be sharing with us. And then after this, I will be opening up this panel to uh, question and answers from the audience. So please start thinking about uh, what questions you might have for our distinguished speakers. Okay, thank you, Gay. And thank you for the preceding two speakers because I'm going to succeed what they, I, thanks for their promotion of their programs. Uh, I will talk about my other passionate program um, that I'm passionate about. Okay, first of all, I would like to, to say that this identification is only one part of my identification, Australian National University. Uh, I have moved back to the U.S., and that's why I am able to do, you know, other kinds of teaching at the University of Maryland and in Baltimore County on ethnography of, of communication and other things. And, and I'm promoting this Cantonese with uh, university <laughs> with University of um, Arizona that just came out. Okay, and this is for intermediate Cantonese. All right, so uh, with that little bit of introduction, okay, I am a typical uh, so-called overseas Chinese. And then I was born in Southeast Asia, in Saigon specifically, and, and I finished high school there and went to Taiwan and came over to this country to do linguistics. And in linguistic, thanks to my linguistics training, I was able to, to do some field work with American Indian languages. Among them was Navajo, where I stay in, the, in Tuba City, Arizona, to do field work. And my first publication was in, on Navajo, on Navajo phonology. Uh, and then thanks to Li Fang Gui, one of the greatest, did you turn that off? for the time being. Yes, thank you. Yeah, not yet, not yet, later on. Can you turn on the light? I'll let you know when, when we, I like this, the slides on. Can you turn on the lights? Oh, thank you. Um, Okay, so, so I'm a, a diaspora, Chinese diaspora product, and that's why I move from place to place, maybe that's why. Um, okay, I have been involved in teaching Chinese language and culture throughout my life, so to speak. Um, in, in, my, in my career, 
but I also have an informal, passionate career that is promoting childhood bilingualism from baby on. All right, and if anybody who wants to talk to me about how to bring up your babies bilingual, I will talk to her or him and for free. <laughs> okay, I have raised two generations. I mean, the second generation is four and a half months old. Okay. <laughs> I have successfully raised the first generation of American bilinguals in this country, even though in those days, you know, it was the, the hostile of bringing up, you, you just have no idea that bringing up your children bilingually, you can meet with all sorts of hostilities. Among them, a typical saying was that you are being very selfish. You know, you, you, you teach them, you know, Chinese, whereas they should be only speaking English. Uh, so this, and, and that comment was from my best friend, my college friend in, from Taiwan University. Another comment, which was most surprising, was from a colleague in linguistics from the University of Illinois who came to visit me in Australia. And he said, just wait and see. When he heard my children speaking Chinese, and at that time, they were six or seven. And, that, and his comment, he's professor of linguistics and teacher of Chinese. And he said, just wait and see till they go to high school. They will, they will hate it. They will lose it. <laughs> so with that, but I'm successful nonetheless. But that's only an anecdotal. But I would, you know, and I have encouraged <coughs> others informally to bring up their children bilingually. So please keep that in mind that there are success stories, and 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 you could do that. Besides what you know, I mean the the institutions that Alice and um, CK have done. So you can set up your own home schools, in other words. Okay, now I want to talk about what's the high level of competence that we need to attain in order to have to create a, a workable so-called workforce bilingually. Uh, I think you need to have very high competence. We, you have to achieve you know, what's beyond, beyond the um, so-called study overseas program. And I'm going to show you later by these slides how you can fall into rivers if you do not achieve high competence, high level of competence. And I think that measurement has to be like for example, if we tra train our students in Chinese, <coughs> their ability in speaking Chinese should be at least like my ability to speak English. Okay, I'm, 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 you know, I I'm okay in English, but I think what we train our students' levels should be at least like my English now. And you have found many people who speak who speak English like my level. Okay, and I think we should aim at that. Otherwise, we will fall into many pitfalls. Okay, I'm going to give you a few examples of that. Edgar Snow, many, many years ago, in, in 19, early 1970, he wrote an article uh, in the Life magazine, and, and he, quoted, he quoted Chairman Mao as saying, Wu Fa Wu Tian. Wu Fa Wu Tian, and he, which you know, means literally. I mean, it's a Chinese. Okay, I'm, I may have to digress a little bit. Like other languages in the world, Chinese has a special kind of metaphors, which is not present in other languages in the world. Chinese has this kind of metaphors called xie hou yu. In other words, you have to match, you have to guess that the, the metaphors are in two parts. This, 
Oh, I have only five minutes. <laughs> okay. <laughs> All right. Anyway, he mistranslated it, and because he, you know, he, as you know, he liked, he really liked Chairman Mao. So he has, he idealized Chairman Mao's position, and he said, his translation of Chairman Mao saying was that I am like an old man carrying an umbrella walking in the rain because Chairman Mao happens to be a very good poet as well. And so I just know had that image of him, which is beautiful, but it is in incorrect translation of that Xie Hou Yu. Another one is last year, last summer in Beijing, you know, the uh, American ambassador to China coming to speak to us, the alumni of Taiwan National University, you know, it, this is another diaspora uh, phenomenon. We held our reunion in Beijing for the first time, okay, for and of course, you know, being a Chinese Americans, we invited the American ambassador to speak to us. Now, at that time, he happened not to be, well, he had, at the specific time of the day in the evening, he had agreed to come even as late as, you know, in the afternoon, and then at the last moment, he, 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 apologized that he could not come and send his deputy to come. Okay, among the things, I mean, of course, being a, a you know, ambassador, I mean, he can, he'd be very smooth in his delivery. And uh, w among, one of the things that he said, he, he knew, he noticed that all Chinese like to use metaphors. And so he used one word, uh, one phrase to say, you people, meaning us, you know, the Chinese Americans present at Peking Hotel at that time, you will come, you have come back to Beijing, now you want to come back to Luoye Guigen. I think that we, Chin the Chinese were too polite to laugh at that time. But after the dinner, I went up to him, I mean, he sent his deputy. I went up to the deputy and, and said, as a former um, so-called scientific linguist in the State Department, I have the obligation to tell you <laughs> in, <laughs> that Luo Ye Guigen is out of fashion, you know, even since my father's days <laughs> already. And, and I think Professor Ling Ji Wang here, you know, who had the foresight to convene this conference in early 1990s, right, 91, in San Francisco at a Japanese hotel. Miyako. <laughs> huh? The Miyako. The Miyako, that's, that's right. That where he promoted this idea of luo di shengen, okay, in other words, you, we have come to this land where we sow, we sow the seeds, we have to grow the roots. So you can see what a contrast that is. Okay, so even American top diplomats misuse metaphors. Now metaphors are very important because they are like vocabulary. You know, like daily vocabulary among Chinese who use it. And you can see from the laughter why, why this is so important and it is very often mistaken. And there are mis many mistakes. Okay, I'd like to show you the more recent, could I have the? Okay, no, just, just very, very fast. Okay, some of these are mistakes made in China on, ch on English. Okay, could you go on? And this was sent to me from my friend in the UN. <laughs> okay, here you can see Xiao Xin Zhui He carefully fall into the river. <laughs> okay, the next one. The next one, please. Oh, 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 I'm sorry. 
Okay, Zong He Su is a kind of dim sum, you know, that is like, like savory cake. Yeah, savory cake, and it's translated as complicated cake. <laughs> All right, next. 八点半交友会所 The first one, half past eight, that's correct. Friend changing club. All right, I have no time to, to... You can ask your friends who can translate this. Okay, 酸菜包 酸菜包, that's another... Another dim sum plate. It's called acid food. All right. <laughs> Sometimes you just don't need to translate, and this is and this is over translated. <laughs> Unnecessarily, oh, hyper corrected. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Next one. Zhuzhuzhongduan. <laughs> Okay, this is 自助终端, it's terminals that you can help yourself. Free, in other words, these are, they are free terminals you can use all the... All right, that's, that's all, I, I don't have time to, to show you. <laughs> okay, thank you. Thank you. Yeah, I, 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 well, do you want me to... Well, let, let's open up the question. Okay. okay. All right, I will answer questions. <laughs> All right, thank you very much. Um, these items have been flo- uh, Excuse me, I, I just want to say, this is, I concluded my, my talk by saying that we have to train language users competently. Yes. Otherwise, half knowledge is worse than zero. Thank you very much. Uh, and it's stuff like this floating around the inter internet that we really, really worry about the Olympics in Beijing. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> I'd like to wrap up this panel by maybe bringing the focus back to California and California's needs. And since this is the first panel, maybe as we go on to our subsequent presentations and speeches, uh, we, can, we can look back to a framework that will help us to look at the needs of California. What do we want to see in the schools from pre-K all the way to university? What are the things that we need to do in teacher development, teacher training, teacher credentialing? And then everything else that comes with the teaching of language in terms of resources, textbooks, curriculum, standards. And I said I wasn't going to speak, but it's hard to tell a teacher not to speak. <laughs> so, so, and being a teacher educator, this is my focus. California, how are we going to meet the demands of teachers in California? And at what quality, what level? And I think Alice is right. California has everything in place to lead the nation in the teaching of Chinese language in our schools, be it public, private, pre-K-12, university level but the pieces aren't talking to each other. And because of that, we don't know what's out there, we don't know what is not out there, what are the holes that we have to plug. In terms of teacher credentialing, the piece is out there. We can credential the teachers through the uh, California Commission on Teacher Credentialing if it continues to exist, <laughs> which is questionable at times. Um, but there are other factors. Okay. I spoke to a community group in Los Angeles, a group of 500 people just through a newspaper article announcing the fact that I will be talking to people about teacher credentialing 
for a single subject Mandarin Chinese credential to be able to teach in the California public schools. It was arranged without realizing that that Sunday was Mother's Day. <laughs> so I was told to prepare handouts for about 200 people who registered. And I said, there's no way you're gonna get uh, 200 people out. So I prepared 100 handouts that afternoon on Mother's Day. 500 people showed up from the community. Okay. And it was given right before we gave the CSET Mandarin test in May. And out of that group that went, we told them not to take the CSET until they took the CBEST test because we have, in order to be credentialed in California, they must have English skills and pass CBEST. So we told them first to take the CBEST, second to take the CSET. So those who took the CSET in, in, um, in May already passed the CBEST. So they took the CSET in Mandarin. Just from May to now, I have recruited six to eight Mandarin teachers now in my Cal State LA teacher credentialing program specifically for Mandarin teaching. And six to eight might not sound like a whole lot, but it's more than zero, right? And so these are the steps that we need to do. But guess what each one of them said to me? Where are the jobs? which school district. And so that's the other thing that I think that's gonna be our other push, Karen and Leslie, is, and we had talked about a, a clearinghouse because schools are saying we can't find the credential teachers to teach, and especially because of No Child Left Behind, they need the credential teachers. Schools are saying they can't find the credential teachers. My teachers are saying they can't find the jobs. Parents are saying we need to have um, Chinese classes taught in the schools. Poli school board members are saying we don't have the money. Principals, superintendents are saying we don't have the money to open. So these are the pieces that we need to get together. And as we talk about standards, as we talk about resource materials, as we talk about teacher development, as we talk about how to teach, what to teach, what quality to teach, we need to think about this as a whole movement that needs to move forward. It's needed. It's not even timely. I think we've kind of missed the boat in some areas. But let's go from today on and see how we can make this into a snowball effect. I'm gonna open up the questions from the audience, and I also got a five minute sign, so I need to uh, <laughs> abide by that. I see two hands in the back, you two can fight it out as to who, can, who wants to ask first. Oh, please use the microphone right there. So the second hand that went up, if you'll make your way toward the microphone. For those of you with questions, if you will make your way toward the microphone, maybe this will flow faster on the side there. I represent a small uh, school district in the East Bay, and we have uh, opened up our minds to teaching Mandarin, and in fact, one of our elementary schools is going to be teaching an after-school class this fall. Now, that is our typical model in the elementary schools, is that uh, la foreign language is only taught after school, and then at the junior high level, it is taught uh, during one period during the day, and um, also at high school. Are there any models that have been very successful as far as teaching um, foreign language in, and in particular Chinese um, in the elementary schools that we could model after? Because I don't, having three children who have graduated from this system in, in high school have, and have not been very fluent at all in the language that they studied all through elementary, junior high, and high school, are there any models that um, have been successful that you could point me in the direction of that I might study and review? Oh, yeah. San Francisco Unified very early on had a uh, Cantonese pro has, sev has a Cantonese program in several schools. And in fact, I saw Leanne in here somewhere. Leanne, where are you? There you go. She, uh, Leanne is principal of one of the schools. And they were the ones who really launched a Chinese model uh, in a public school system. 
And so Leanne would be somebody that you can speak with. Also in, uh, Leanne, help me, where's Mary Jew at? Cupertino is another public school uh, system that has uh, emergent Chinese, this in, the, in that case, Mandarin programs. And uh, LA Unify has some, the Alhambra School District also down south, ha it's a school district, it's a mid-sized school district with three high schools and they offer Mandarin in all three of their high schools. That's the only district I know where all of their high schools offer a Mandarin program. Now Alice has mentioned, um, you know, Case is the premier one up here. Okay, and uh, so those are a few that you can start with. And Alice, did you want to say something? Right, I understood your question to relate to an after school program rather than a, a program in the normal day. I'm not a big fan of that model because I've never seen one that was successful and I've looked every place. And too often I'm afraid that there is the, the gesture that is made in uh, a FLES or FLEX program is to get the parent community off our back. We'll give them something to do because then we can say we have a Chinese program. But uh, the best I can, that can be said about it, if it's well done, if it's enjoyable for the children, is that it will inspire some interest for continuing study that if a program is available at an upper level, that it, it will bring people along. But I, I am really skeptical about the value of the once or twice a week after school time because I have not seen a model developed uh, with a number of contact hours available that say you can do anything other than a very superficial level. And I think it's one of the ways we cheat ourselves in the, sc in the school systems to thinking we're doing something that we're not doing very well or very thoroughly. I, I agree, thank you. That's why I want to look to other schools who may have a different model that's successful. There is one more model that I'm aware of down south, also in a public school district, and it's with Palos Verdes School District. They got a FLAP grant, a, a foreign language development grant from the Department of Education, and their model is a partial model, but it's not after school. They, they, they looked at the research and they started with the PE periods. And then from the PE, it'll grow into other content areas. So that's another model that is out there. Uh, we don't, you know, it's so new, we don't know which model is better than what, but at least for your research, you know that there are these models out there. Okay, thank you so okay. much for your thank time. You. Did you have something? Okay. The next question. Hello, everyone. Um, my name is Hai Ying Song. By the way, do I have a little bit more than five minutes? No, just okay. No. All right. You don't have. I'll, I'll try my best. You have um, a short question that you can ask. Um, my name is Hai Ying Song. I'm a parent of a two-year-old. Um, I am bringing him up bilingually. I like to share my experience here, and then therefore raise a question, and some maybe some some one of you in the policy making can help us out. Um, I have searched high and low for a Chinese um, program in a preschool, and I visited one in Emmerville four times and I voted down for reasons I can discuss later. And then another one, it was okay, it's a B minus, but it, it was the only one out there, so I was ready to put him in and then it was shut down because the, uh, the owner or the school uh, president was uh, some doing something against the law. So <laughs> back to square one, since he was born, my husband was furious with me thinking I wasn't doing my job. Um, anyway, <laughs> I was so desperate, I was taking him to China last month for a month looking for, thinking of putting him in school there. Of course, I found several good ones and my husband uh, rejected, which I understand. But anyway, <laughs> back to this question of um, educating the uh, bilingually, especially Chinese, uh, being such a difficult language. And, uh, I feel like I have found a Zhiyin in Beverly uh, speech. and. Um, there is, I don't know how many of you have heard of Harold E. Jones Child Study Center here? None? It's actually a preschool run by UC Berkeley. <laughs> anyway, uh, I have uh, applied for that school because they open to basically faculties here and also administrators' children. So um, 
there's a strong, very strict age limit, so he's eligible next year. So when I called that, uh, that school asking them if there's any chance that they would start a Chinese program, I was told for two reasons. One, there aren't many Chinese families there, therefore there's no interest. And second, I, um, second reason they gave me is that, oh, we're UC Berkeley, we won't be interested in that kind of program. Okay, <laughs> so when I saw this um, uh, meeting today, I jumped at it to see if I can voice my opinion and hopefully get some help because here in East Bay, there is absolutely very limited source of uh, education in very early childhood. And in fact, um, parent, uh, uh, a, par a friend of mine, we um, made a petition to this very famous Chinese American International School in San Francisco hoping they could start a program here in the East Bay. And in one week, we summoned up 60 parents. 60 parents in one week, and there's more follow. But finally, um, they t turned us down um, for the reason maybe financially they were not able to um, um, you know, start a program at this time. So um, if any one of you have any suggestions as to how to promote um, this program, you know, maybe in, in, in this level at UC Berkeley, because this school is run by UC Berkeley, and hopefully promote this ch early childhood Chinese education in the East Bay. Um, that would be really helpful. Thank you so much. Okay, thank you. I think uh, for the sake of time, uh, we're, gonna we're gonna have to wrap up, but what I suggest is, this forums of this type are wonderful because you're here because you're interested in the topic at hand. So for the speakers on the panel or the, or the audience members who are coming up to ask questions, go talk to each other. We still have a luncheon yeah. right this afternoon. This is where the dialoguing and the advocacy can begin. So thank you to all our panel members. Thank you for being a great audience and